Hello, and welcome to today's Estadia and MicroFocus joint webinar. I can see additional participants are actively still joining, so we'll allow them to get settled and we'll start the webinar in two minutes. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining today's Estadia and MicroFocus webinar featuring moving IBM mainframe workload to AWS. During the presentation, if you have any questions, feel free to type it into your chat box on your control panel and we'll save it for the end of the presentation. We have an interesting presentation in store for you today, so let's get started. Just so a quick walk through the agenda, we'll start off by introducing you to the presenters. We'll then walk through on why you should move your IBM work mainframe workload to AWS and why you should do that with the Estadia and MicroFocus company. We have a live demo in store for you where you can show where you can see the mainframe application working in AWS. This will probably elicit some questions you may have, so we'll have question and answers at the end of at the end of the presentation, following up with upcoming webinars and a special offer just for you. About our presenters, our first presenter today is Craig Marble. Craig is the Vice President of Legacy Modernization at Estadia. Craig's been with Estadia for seven years. Before that, over 16 years with MicroFocus. Altogether, he has 25 years of IT experience focused on modernization on the product, pre-sales, and delivery management side. We also have Eddie Hewton. Eddie is the Director of Product Management at MicroFocus. Eddie's been with MicroFocus for over 19 years and has a total of over 28 years of IT industry experience. Eddie is experienced in mainframe application, development, deployment, and in modernization. And he specializes in product management and the service delivery side. Thank you for joining us today, Eddie. Last but certainly not least, we have John Oman with us. John is the Director of Software Development at Estadia. John's been with Estadia for over 27 years, and he has 42 years of mainframe experience, specializing in IBM, Unisys mainframe, and distributed computing. So we're excited to have John on board with us today. Without further ado, I would love to hand this over to Craig. Great, thanks, Desiree. Uh, I'd like to add my welcome to everybody this afternoon. Really appreciate you taking the time to join us. Uh, for those of you who don't know Astadia or who we are, just a little quick uh, uh, summary about Astadia. So we are a, a mid-sized uh, technology consultancy, and we really focus on maximizing the impact and minimizing the risk of today's blended enterprise and cloud ecosystem. So, you know, some companies can put everything in the cloud. Some companies need sort of a blended system of on-premises and cloud, which uh, can make things a little complicated. So we really uh, do our best to help customers navigate their way through this journey, uh, whether it's managing their cloud environment or they're implementing their DevOps environment or testing or uh, legacy modernization, of course, which is near and dear to my heart. Uh, we we uh, lead our customers down that path and partner with them to find the solutions that work best for them, not just for today, but into the future. And what really sets us apart and why clients tend to go with us is our experience and our agility. And as an example of that, um, the average consultant uh, at Stadia has 24 years of experience. And you can compare that to some of the uh, larger systems integrators who tend to have uh, consultants that may be 24 years old. So we, we really do have a lot of experience in this realm. On the next slide, I'm just going to cover really quickly uh, what we do at Estadia and our, our main thrusts. And um, we focus on uh, three main areas, um, develop, manage, and migrate. So on the develop side, uh, we can help you design systems. If you have specs that you want us to develop applications, we can do that. We offer testing as a service solutions, uh, DevOps implementation solutions, all under our develop business line. 
Along with that, we have a managed business line that uh, once you get these things developed, helping you manage it. And that could be uh, on-prem uh, hardware, right? It could be a cloud environment that you need help managing. So uh, we help you um, manage your, your assets. And then of course, um, my personal favorite is the migrate business unit. And this is where we assess, discover, and help you modernize uh, not only your legacy infrastructure, but also your applications, databases, and whether that could be the re reuse, rewrite, or replace. Uh, we we per, um, usually lead off with reuse because that seems to get the most bang for the buck in making use of what you have and repurposing it. And I've added in here a few statistics. We've done um, more than 90 mainframe migrations on both the IBM and Unisys side to really all flavors of distributed operating systems, uh, the primary uh, ones being Windows, Linux, and Unix. And this includes both on-prem and cloud, uh, such as AWS. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Eddie just to give you a, a quick snapshot of uh, MicroFocus for those of you who may not be familiar with MicroFocus. Uh, Eddie? Yeah, thanks, Craig. And uh, I'd just like to extend my welcome as well to everyone and just to say how uh, pleased I am to be presenting this uh, this session with Estadia. Now, first of all, I just wanted to say a few words about MicroFocus. Um, now obviously, we've been in the news uh, fairly recently. And uh, with the merger with HPE, uh, we now have one of the most robust portfolios of enterprise-grade software in the world, really across a range of key areas. Uh, that actually makes us the seventh largest pure play software company in the world. Now, today, the new MicroFocus really has an incredible workforce with 18,000 plus employees, supporting over 40,000 customers globally, uh, including 98 of the Fortune 100. So we have the global scale to meet the needs of the largest enterprise and government customers, but importantly, we've kept our core values. And as I said, I'm really delighted to be working with a partner like Estadia to provide the flexibility to allow our joint customers to take mainframe workload into the AWS cloud. Now, MicroFocus has been providing solutions for enterprise customers um, with business applications on the mainframe for over three decades. And we've been really helping them to modernize you know, the business applications themselves, uh, to support new user requirements, to simplify or consolidate applications, or to integrate business systems into newer technologies uh, within the systems of engagement. Um, we help customers with the application delivery process, we call it DevOps, um, to change how applications are developed and released to the business. And making mainframe, agile, making mainframe development more agile and responsive to business need. And lastly, we let customers modernize the infrastructure itself by making mainframe applications and the value they provide available as workload wherever the business needs it. Now, this has allowed us over the last 30 years to provide a really a rich set of technologies that underpins Estadia's ability to move your fit for work, fit for purpose mainframe workload onto the cloud. Now, we will be touching upon some of these capabilities a little later in this session. But the enterprise solutions for MicroFocus are being used successfully by customers worldwide to meet their mainframe modernization challenges. You know, from application analysis to modern development tooling and processes, uh, to flexible mainframe testing through deployment, deploy, through to deploying mainframe applications on alternative production environments, or actually to control and manage the development and release process through best-in-class SCCM tooling. So I think one of the questions is, you know, why are organizations looking to move workload off the mainframe and why are they targeting AWS? Now, I think key to understanding this is really the business applications developed over decades, typically written in COBOL and PL1 that are running on the mainframe today. Now, these really represent the core business systems for many global enterprises, and they continue to deliver real business value. However, I think organizations now really need to consider you know, how they exploit these uh, applications on open commodity-based infrastructures where perhaps AWS is already part of their ongoing strategy. Or perhaps compliance may be dictating that customer data needs to be stored locally so the driver becomes actually delivering uh, a service um, in a localized environment. Now, Tied to that, you know, opportunities may exist in new geos. 
um, but organizations might be struggling to actually recruit local mainframe skills. So this becomes a barrier to entry for them. Or they might actually be looking to really repurpose those tried and trusted business applications that are delivering value, but on lower cost commodity platforms. So I think this is really why customers are looking uh, to AWS and considering it as a way to modernize their infrastructure. But I think one of the questions you should be asking is, is the cloud ready for mainframe workloads? So Craig. Yeah, thank you, uh, Eddie. Uh, so we, if we take a look at um, the cloud adoption rates, it is just phenomenal. And we have seen uh, an acceleration of that even in the past couple of years. Uh, this slide demonstrates just uh, just how how phenomenal that is. Uh, 122 billion will be spent in 2020, and that's from 19 billion in just just a couple of years ago. And that, that's that's really pretty incredible. And along with that, of course, comes the increased need for managed services to manage that environment, whether it's your own managed services team and uh, your staff, or whether you outsource it to somebody like Stadia or other uh, organizations. Um, but we find that 85% uh, of customers are already beyond the discovery cloud phase. I mean, it wasn't that long ago that, you know, you would hear people say, oh yeah, we're thinking about it. But, you know, thinking and doing has, uh, has uh, it has just accelerated. And we're seeing that uh, a lot of people are beyond just thinking about it and are actually taking action. And in the next slide, um, if we take a look at how this happened, it's really happened in waves. So in the first wave of adoption, it was some of the easy stuff, right? So some of the lower risk um, items were, ex uh, were exploited in the cloud, such as moving your dev and test environment into the cloud or putting your web uh, sites up there, um, putting in CRM applications, things that uh, maybe weren't so critical to have up all the time just in case it went down. Um, you know, there was some some skepticism about the stability or the uh, reliability of the cloud early on. Uh, so there's some of the low, sort of the low risk um, applications initially went into the cloud. And then as it began to prove itself, you began to see a second wave. And then you have things like putting email servers out there, using it for um, backups, um, uh, using it for uh, real bursty apps, apps that maybe require small periods of high intensive use, but the rest of the time it actually has low use. And of course the flexibility and the elasticity of the cloud supports that very well. And now we're really moving into the third wave where we're seeing that uh, companies are putting more and more of their critical business operations in the cloud. Um, and that could be uh, serv serv containers, uh, applications, ERP applications, and of course, uh, legacy mainframe applications are um, a good target to move into the cloud. On the next slide, um, if you think about why AWS uh, is uh, ready for mainframe workload, I like to think of it this way. Um, in terms of just raw numbers, if you think about Amazon.com, which of course runs on AWS, um, as of 2017, they had some 372 million items that you could order, uh, and they accounted for 43% of all online retail sales. Uh, they had roughly 300 million user accounts as of February, just about 2017, just about a year ago, and were routinely running millions of transactions per day. And I'm not talking just about sales, but also all the back office operations. So you might say, well, what does this have to do with anything? Well. If you think about it this way, have you ever not been able to purchase anything on Amazon? I haven't. I mean, I can tell you whether it's one o'clock in the morning and I'm, I see something on TV that I think, oh gosh, I'd like to have one of those. I can pick up my phone and order it and boom, there you go. Um, I've never not been able to purchase anything on Amazon and all of this is done without a mainframe in sight. So uh, it really does prove that the uh, stability and the processing capability is there. Um, and then in terms of Amazon Web Services as a business, it's a, really a phenomenal story that uh, you start eight years ago, they went from zero revenue up to 18 billion in revenue just this last year. So that, that's pretty incredible. Um, so it, it really is a compelling uh, argument to start uh, considering AWS for your workload, but primarily on the next slide, um, if you think about some of the more technical reasons of why you might want to use, consider AWS for your mainframe workload, 
is um, they provide high availability and they do that through a, a multiple mechanisms. Some of which are things like uh, having multiple zones and data centers around the globe, something like 18 regions and 51 availability zones. Uh, it allows you to dis distribute your applications all in all of those zones and, and fall fail over if one area happens to go out. Um, in addition to that, as Eddie mentioned earlier, maybe you want to take um, a mainframe application and make it available, that processing, that core system to a new market in a different geographical location. Well, it'd be great to be able to do that uh, and make it available uh, near and to the end users for performance reasons. So with the availability zones in the regions around the globe, you can actually put that application as close to the end user as possible to ensure that you get the good performance. In addition to that, um, there's uh, automated load balancing, which provides elasticity that is extremely easy to set up and use and uh, not only gives you failover support, but allows you to ramp up and ramp down as needed. So you can uh, uh, set the load balancer to say when, when this particular uh, instance of EC2 starts reaching a certain CPU threshold, let's say, you know, it gets up to 80%, automatically spin off another instance to take on new workload to ensure that things don't get bogged down. And when the workload starts to drop, then you can start shutting those instances down. And of course, that means that you're only paying for what you use, right? So you don't have to buy a giant machine because you might need that processing capability maybe maybe a month in total out of the year. Um, you're, you're able to scale up and down as you need to and not lay out a lot of cash for a lot of heavy duty hardware. In addition, it's very easy to reconfigure uh, your environment for performance and availability. And in the demo, you'll see some of that, how easy it is to say, yeah, you know what? Uh, this isn't really working well enough for me. I need to give it some more power. And it's much, it's very, very easy to essentially put it on a new machine without actually moving anything to a new machine. And you'll see that uh, later on. And it also, of course, uh, gives you a simplified backup and recovery process. So Amazon, in addition to taking snapshots of your environments on a regular basis, you can do things such as uh, put your applications and backup in a different geographic location, a different data center, so that if something does happen, if there is some disaster, your application and your replicated data uh, is there and ready to go at, at, at a moment's notice. Um, and um, uh, on top of all this, it is a very easy environment to experiment in at a very low cost. So they, in other words, uh, I hear people say it's easy to fail. And what I mean by that is, you can say, you know what, I want to try something out with this uh, legacy application. I'm going to create a, uh, an instance of an existing uh, environment that I have. I'm going to make some changes. I'm going to tie it into some, some external sources. Uh, well, it didn't work. Okay, I just, I just uh, destroy that instance and I'm done. And it's very low cost in, uh, in terms of another option of going out and buying a piece of hardware to try out what it is that you want to try out, right? So, so there's a lot of benefits there. And of course, one of the best things about it is there is no hardware for you to procure and maintain, which um, makes things much easier. So in the next slide, what we really want to do is take this mainframe workload and push it into the AWS environment. So how do you do that? And why would you want to do that with a Stadia and MicroFocus? Uh, you can go to the next slide now, Desiree. So to begin with, um, we at Estadia have a proven process that we have used, um, well, for the past 25 years or so. Uh, we did our first mainframe migration in the early 90s and uh, have, have continued to do them uh, ever since. And so we have this process that we have really honed and perfected over that 25 year uh, period and it starts with um, uh, our transformation engine, right? So this transformation engine is really the key to our productivity. So in a typical project, the first thing we do is a discovery, discovering what you have, your data, your code, uh, ancillary software and hardware, your processes, and the requirements that you have for your ultimate end goal, whether that's something on premises or obviously Today, it makes more sense to go to um, something like Amazon Web Services. 
All of that information <clears throat> that we gather is fed into our rules-based transformation engine. Okay? And then in the design stage, we start architecting your cloud solution, architecting the databases. Maybe you're going from a hierarchical database to a relational database. Maybe you've got some interfaces that need to be moved over. Um, and then of course, there may be some customizations that need to take uh, place for things like maybe assembler code or some other unsupported languages on the distributed side. Then we move into the modernization stage, and this is really where the heavy lifting happens. And this is where we make use of that transformation engine, where we start um, modifying that code. And when I say modify, I don't mean we delete anything. We just comment out what's there, um, and then we insert new code. And when I say new code, we're talking about minimum changes, okay? The only thing we change is what we absolutely have to. And that typically tends to be things like database calls because you're going to be calling a different database. You may need to make some changes to your sorting rules because you're working with ASCII, uh, ASCII instead of EBCDIC. Uh, so all of that happens in the modern, modern, modernized phase. And then, of course, we move into the testing phase where we start testing um, what we have uh, just mo uh, modified. Once the testing is completed, um, we obviously need to start our implementation process. And then, to be honest, we actually start deploying pieces before the testing phase or in parallel with the testing phase because there are things that you can do in parallel, such as setting up your production environment uh, and get it ready to receive the actual source code and executables. Um, but in addition to that, we, um, we need to migrate uh, the dynamic data, that is data that is not static and can't be moved beforehand. That's data that's modified and manipulated uh, all day long. So uh, we generally do a cut over on the weekend. So you finish up on Friday, you do the migration uh, of the data over the weekend, and then Monday morning you open up for business and everything's on a new platform. Um, and then of course, uh, once it's up there, uh, begins the management piece. And typically, uh, we can either manage it for you, which uh, some customers have us do, or we can help you get ramped up in order to manage it for yourself. So this is generally um, our, our proven process that we use today. On the next slide, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the, the tooling that we use. So in addition to our transformation engine uh, that we've developed over 25 years of research and development, we also have, um, some other tools that uh, help us in our, our analysis process, um, and Eddie will cover uh, some of those tools in a few minutes, but in addition to that, we have um, a Stadia Data Pro line of product that we use internally, and that is tools that we have to automatically uh, convert files from the uh, mainframe format to the distributed target, uh, DDL converters, extract, transform, load programs, and then we have uh, other tools such as our high-speed parallel load tool, which, which moves data from the mainframe to the distributed side using multi-threaded uh, capabilities. Um, and what I mean by that is we basically set up threads where we pump down blob data, right, which takes a long time. And then we have other threads that are sort of the fast lanes where all the text data just comes down really, really fast. So uh, we try to do things as efficiently and quickly as possible. Uh, and uh, this is a uh, proven technology that we use over and over again. Uh, the next slide, I describe um, a little bit about uh, where the pieces fit. So um, if you look at the top, <clears throat> you're gonna look at your typical IBM mainframe environment. So you've got your batch uh, application, your CICS applications, your IMS applications, and those could be composed of assembler, COBOL, PL1, so natural, maybe Fortran, of course, you're gonna have some JCL. If you've got batch, uh, you may have some rec scripts. And in that environment, you're gonna have uh, possibly some vSIM files and some GDGs, um, a database, most likely DB2 or IMS, and then all of the pieces that support that, right? Scheduling, printing, code, uh, 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 source control, uh, security, and so on. And today, all of that uh, application um, is, those applications are accessed through either custom user interfaces, uh, maybe TN3270 screens, or uh, web access. And below that is a mapping to the AWS environment. So um, within the AWS um, 
uh, environment, you've got your virtual environment, right? Your sandbox in the AWS cloud. And within that, you set up instances of EC2s. Those are, that's the compute, right? It's the virtual machine. And we have in there what we call the mainframe cloud framework. And really, um, in this case, it's, it's really the, the microfocus uh, tool set, right? The enterprise server, which allows you to run uh, mainframe applications on other platforms. And again, Eddie will be going into that a little bit more uh, in a few minutes. So those same batch applications and CICS and IMS applications just basically come off of the mainframe and get plopped down into this mainframe cloud framework running under enterprise server, again, with a minimum amount of change. Um, the data files can come down as is. You can bring those vSAM files on down or if you want to, you can convert those to uh, relational data, uh, relational tables uh, and data, which we can we can do, and, and a lot of customers do that. And actually, it makes sense because then that data is a lot easier to access from other external applications that are um, used to working with SQL type data, not flat file data. Your uh, database would get converted into something like AWS Aurora, uh, but if you don't want to use Aurora, you can of course use other products in the RDS uh, product. Um, or in the case of IMS, maybe you would uh, be interested in keeping it IMS and um, make use of the MicroFocus IMS database solution. So really all the pieces on the mainframe map quite well down to the AWS environment. And all of this is supported by AWS products like CodeCommit, CloudWatch for giving you statistics and monitoring, uh, your uh, uh, access management. Um, S3 is really your kind of your bulk storage area. And then on the left-hand side, you see the ELB, that's the Elastic Load Balancer. So that comes into play when you want to have multiple EC2 instances running that application to handle load. So you would spin up EC2 instance uh, as needed, or you can even say, I want to start with four instances and I want them running all the time. It really depends on your application and your needs. But the really great thing is, is that your external interfaces, such as your custom user interfaces and any TN3270 screens uh, emulation that you might be using or web interfaces, they just simply need to be pointed to the new um, uh, environment and they can work um, virtually as is. So there's very little disruption to your end users. So they can tip, uh, go home on a Friday night and come back on a Monday morning and be working um, uh, in the cloud and really not even know, not even notice a difference. And that's one of the great benefits of doing this. Um, so I want to get uh, Eddie's uh, an opportunity here to discuss uh, some of the tools that we've mentioned. And so Eddie, I'll hand it back over to you. Okay, thanks, Greg. Um, so next slide. So yes, yeah, so what we're going to be talking about um, now is really just some of the um, the, the key components, uh, the products from MicroFocus that really underpin um, a Stadia's deployment process to take your workload, uh, obviously from the mainframe today, uh, through to the cloud. Now, we're, we're not going to touch on all of the products. Um, Craig mentioned um, um, the enterprise server, we'll touch upon that. Um, but we'll walk through some of the, the key components um, to allow you, enable you to actually move uh, workload to the cloud in a sustainable way. So if we go to the next slide, please. Now, the first thing that Greg mentioned was the discovery phase. Uh, and then really before considering any move to a new platform, you really need to understand what your mainframe inventory consists of, You know how the applications are architected, uh, their complexity, uh, where the dependencies are between the systems. Now, in many cases, all too frequently, that knowledge is actually locked away in the years of experience that a few SMEs have within your business. And we tackle that really through Enterprise Analyzer, um, which allows you to build a, a centralized fact-based business and technical repository uh, that's actually built directly from your application artifacts. Now, it can be built automatically and we can plug it directly into your mainframe host SCCM environment. Uh, and then once it's actually built its repository, it then provides the knowledge to allow you to actually look across your entire inventory, uh, to look at all the application dependencies and perhaps look at things like maintainability indices. 
um, it allows you to start uh, that that journey of understanding and documenting business processes in the applications. Um, you can then start to use it to assess the impact of application-wide changes. Uh, and you can then identify the key areas in your application that will either need change or need to be modified when moving the application to a new data platform. And that was the area that Craig mentioned in terms of, of then using that to drive the transformation process. So really think of Enterprise Analyzer as the, the what, the where, the how of application change. So you can actually make informed business decisions based on an accurate knowledge about the systems that make up your mainframe inventory. Now, you know, whether you're moving applications onto uh, AWS as part of a move away from the mainframe completely, or you actually want to have the flexibility to deploy workload onto lower cost cloud-based infrastructures, um, and also back to the mainframe, you will still need modern development tools to maintain, modernize, and test those applications once they've moved. Now, enterprise developer is a modern mainframe development environment based on industry standard IDEs. Uh, we support both Visual Studio and Eclipse. And it really allows mainframe developers to develop applications in AWS in their own mainframe development environment with no conflicts, no resource contention. Now, when deployed onto AWS, it provides, importantly, full compatibility with the mainframe so that applications can be built and tested locally regardless of where they're going to be deployed. It could be back to the mainframe, it could be onto an AWS instance. Now, with modern tooling, you know, we provide things like smart editing, local compilation, uh, visual debugging, code analytics, coding standards checks. All these tools um, will be familiar and actually expected uh, by new talent coming into the business. And it's all about actually improving the efficiency of that development process. It also provides tools that allow you to actually start to leverage the power of managed code frameworks uh, and to really align your mainframe applications with Java, .NET, uh, or to actually service enable those applications. And, and lastly, it really sort of then provides the integration either back to the mainframe, if you're deploying back there uh, as an option, or to other tools that make up your agile development uh, toolchain. So I think with Enterprise Developer, you know, the customers that have deployed that to date, you know, they're seeing very significant improvements in developer efficiency, uh, and they're seeing that without actually uh, losing any um, quality of the applications being delivered. Now, you know, a crucial step uh, when you move from one platform to the next is how you manage your source change and configuration management process. Now, on the mainframe, the SCCM process is really the backbone of how you deliver change into production on the host. Now, as I say, if, whether you're moving off the mainframe directly uh, or entirely, or you plan to deploy applications to both AWS and the host, uh, you need to be able to manage the sources effectively on different platforms. And this is really where Enterprise Sync comes in. It's an enterprise scale distributed SCCM environment that runs in the cloud and it can support parallel development scale, agile practices, and its modern tools are integrated directly into the enterprise developer IDE. Now, what really sets us apart, though, is that it automatically synchronizes source artifacts and metadata between the mainframe and the distributed environment. Now, why is that important? Well, if you're moving work, if you're moving development into AWS, you need to access sources in a cloud-based SCCM environment, but you really want to be sure that those changes that are made in AWS are synchronized back to the mainframe and importantly, vice versa. Now, in that way, you can ensure con the continuity of what you develop and build in both platforms. Now, even if you're moving off the mainframe entirely to deploy exclusively in the cloud, during that, that uh, that deployment process, that migration process, it's highly unlikely that those mainframe applications will remain static during that, that migration project. So being able to automatically synchronize both environments during that process is actually gonna help you avoid costly rework. And lastly, uh, Craig mentioned at Enterprise Server, this actually really provides the flexible platform agnostic a production environment that allows you to deploy mainframe applications pretty much unchanged onto Linux, Windows, and Unix running in AWS. 
Now, literally, we have got hundreds of customers that trust the Microfocus Enterprise Server environment today to run their production systems. And it runs those production systems with the same level of reliability, availability, and service serviceability that they see on the host, all without actually compromising you know, the security that they're used to. Now, you know, many customers have used Enterprise Server to, you know, perhaps realize you know, very significant cost savings when moving workload to alternative platforms. But more and more, we're seeing organizations looking at the flexibility to get into new markets or geographical regions by taking those mainframe applications, uh, repurposing that tried and trusted business function and actually deploying it onto a lower cost commodity platform. And the AWS cloud is perfect for that scenario. Now, the proof of the pudding in, in the UK, as we say, is in the eating. So uh, let's take a look at the solution running in AWS. Uh, and John, I think that's your bit. Yes, it is. Uh, welcome, everybody. This is the console for AWS, uh, where it shows the uh, all the different uh, modules that you can run through AWS, the EC2, uh, the CloudWatch, the R uh, Relational Database Service, RDS, uh, the different modules that you can run uh, using uh, the AWS environment. Uh, we're going to spend most of our time here today, although we will show you some, some demonstrations of uh, the actual running environment. We have a demo base machine running here. Instance type is an M42 extra large currently running. Uh, I will log into that and show you uh, the application running. Right now, uh, here is a module that was mentioned, the enterprise developer, where we brought into the enterprise developer some screens, uh, some BMS screens. If you want to see the, the BMS, uh, everybody probably is familiar with that. I also have source, batch source, online source that was brought in, uh, targeting the IBM machines, uh, and all the other modules, the JCL, uh, whatever you want can be brought in here and used to compile and run as though you're on an IBM machine. Uh, also, we are accessing a database, uh, the Aurora database through AWS. Uh, we have several uh, tables built here. We can display uh, items in the customer table, which we have three. And I'll show you later where I updated uh, one of these records. Uh, anyway, so this is the database that we're accessing. Now you can access through Enterprise, uh, through, the, through the MicroFocus solution. You can access uh, DB2 or LUW or or whatever database you choose, uh, but uh, this right now today we're accessing the Aurora database that comes with AWS. Now, in order to demo, I have, I have a remote desktop connection to the server on Amazon AWS running the Enterprise Server Administration. This is where I can start and stop the instance of Enterprise Server. Uh, I can go in and display all the, the internals of it. Uh, anything that you want to uh, go do is all available through the Enterprise Server Administrator. Uh, I can also, you notice here I'm already running, move this out of the way a second. I'm already running the Enterprise Server in the background and I will connect to it using a 3270 emulation and I go to my application and up pops a uh, IBM mainframe CICS menu for our customer tracking system. This system was written a couple uh, centuries, or centuries ago, a couple uh, of years ago, like 25 years ago, and we're still using parts of it today where, uh, not all of it, but parts of it, so we can actually go in and view things like customers, uh, calls, add problems, uh, check internally for licenses. We can update, uh, we can go into a customer record and actually update, uh, let's update a contact. Oops, 
helps if I change the TRAN code to update. Customer is updated. Uh, so this is the actual application running in the enterprise server environment, uh, showing the uh, data that's been updated and uh, 3270 accessing the local environment running in AWS. Now, I could just as easily run an emulation from my local desktop accessing the, uh, mach the AWS machine, or I can actually log into an AWS machine like I am here. Back to my database. Uh, if I requery my database, you'll see that I updated my customer record here with the second contact bit of information. So it does prove that I am using this database with my online screen. Uh, also, if I go back into the AWS environment, I have uh, the Cloud Watch where it shows me my uh, charts of my activity that I'm using. Here it knows, see my processor started to go up. Uh, so I'm actually accessing my machine the I can do uh, database uh, accesses. Different charts can be displayed. Widgets can be added to this. Uh, you have a lot of flexibility in the AWS environment. You also have uh, uh, the S3, which is work air, uh, working disk area, storage area that you can use, utilize. You have the Aurora database definition. Right now, you, you can see the Aurora database that I'm using. It is using a DBR4 large instance class of the AWS database. If I click on it, it'll show me uh, internal charts, CloudWatch of of the individual uh, instance that I'm running. If if I decide that I have a large workload coming up, I can go into actions here. I tell everybody to get off the database. I can go into modify. I'm not going to actually do it, but I can come in here and actually change it to right now I'm running a two CPU, 15 gigabytes of memory. I can change it to be all the way up to a 64 CPU, 488 bytes of memory, gigabytes of memory, or I can lower it down if my cost, uh, if I want to lower my cost. So I'm very flexible. As soon as I clicked on one of these and said apply, it would shut it down, bring it back up as a new instance, new size. The same thing that can be done for the EC2 environment. Here I have the environment that I connected to. Here it shows the, uh, the, the public DNS name, the public IP that I can connect to. Also, it shows that I'm running a M4 two extra large instance type. If I want to change that, I can go, here are all the instance types for the AWS environment. I have T2, where I go from one to eight processors with uh, different amounts of, of memory. Here I have the M5 uh, model type, where I have large through 24 extra large, which has 96 CPUs. Here's the M4 that I'm running, the two extra large. has I have eight CPUs running 32 gigabytes. Uh, then I have M3 and T2. Uh, here's all the different, uh, the chart of everything you get with each of the different uh, instance types. So going back to here, this module here I have shut down. It's, the, uh, it's a stopped module. So all I have to do to change an instance type is to stop it. And I go to Instance Settings, say Change Instance Type. I want to change this to a, a T2 Micro or T2 Medium to save cost. I would just apply that. <coughs> so it's a T2 Medium. I'd right click and say Start It, and it would bring it up as a T2 Medium Type. So as a matter of a reboot, I've changed from, from multi-processors down to a single processor or two processor machine saving money, or if I've had a large workload coming up, I could just as easily change it to a, a, a 24, 36 CPU machine running the same software. It's just a matter of a reboot. 
So that is a quick tour of AWS with all the different modules. There's a lot here that you can learn about, find out about. You have the load balancer, which we use. We use, did a lot of testing on the load balancer. It works great. Uh, Craig mentioned that, where you can actually tell it to uh, change to from two instances running up to uh, 12 instances, if that's how many you need. As soon as you get up to a certain percentage of workload, uh, it can automatically adjust and fire up extra copies of the machine that you have designated. Uh, also, you can uh, sh it will shut down when they are not being used. Very quickly, can you turn on the elastic load balancer? Anyway, that is a quick tour of AWS and an application running in the AWS environment. And I believe that's it for the demo. I will turn this back to the presentation to Desiree. And thank you very much for your time. Great. Thanks, John. So. Um, I, I think it's uh, pretty powerful to see that uh, not only do we have a mainframe application running live, a real, real world mainframe application running live in AWS, uh, but also how easy it is to uh, change the characteristics of that application. Meaning, if I need more power, I add, uh, I, I can uh, throw some some processors and memory at it, or I can create multiple instances. And uh, we actually are wrapping up a performance study right now that we'll be publishing uh, within the next month that where we've done a study on the different sizes of the single machines, as well as the different configurations of clustered machines uh, and their performance. Uh, so be on the lookout for that. So just a recap of what we covered today, uh, we, we discussed uh, why why you might want to consider moving your IBM mainframe workload to AWS, some of the business drivers around that, uh, uh, maybe breaking into new markets, maybe taking some of the workload off of your mainframe today to free up space for more critical workload. Uh, we talked about why Stadia and MicroFocus is your uh, go-to partner from a uh, services uh, perspective as well as a product perspective. And then we uh, showed you the IMS domain, um, IBM mainframe AWS reference architecture. Um, we have a paper on that that you can download. Um, and then you saw a dive, live demo of a mainframe application running in AWS today. So with that, I think Desiree, uh, we would be ready to open it up to Q&A. Thanks, Craig. Just a quick reminder, if you have a question to ask our experts, feel free to type it into the chat box on your screen. Now let's address some of the questions that have been we've been receiving throughout the presentation. The first question uh, says, what is the most difficult part of a project like this? Mm. All right. Well, you know, <clears throat> you might think that the most difficult part of uh, a project such as this is the technology, and it, it really isn't. Um, the technology is there. Um, mainframe applications have been running uh, off the mainframe for decades. Uh, we've been doing it for decades, and MicroFocus has been providing support for that for decades. Um, moving it to the cloud really isn't that big of a deal because it's really the same technology stack it's just it's, it's on a different piece of hardware uh, rather than a, a server sitting in your your uh, data center it's in a data center that's managed by AWS so that, that it's really not a big leap um, what we find is uh, the biggest issue or the biggest challenge can be around the uh, people and processes so um, a lot of times you have um, people who may have been doing their jobs very well for a very long time and sometimes it can be disconcerting to them to hear that you're going to move this mainframe application to the cloud right and all kinds of bells and whistles go off and they get very fearful and to be quite frank they will sometimes maybe um resist right they might uh, not be as cooperative as you might want or uh, drag their feet on providing answers that some people might need to achieve uh, the end goal. Um, the best way to address that is to allay their fears. Just because the application is moving onto a new technology stack does not mean that the developers are no longer relevant. 
they are very relevant. The developers will still be developing in COBOL. They'll still be working in the languages that they're familiar with. It'll be in a new development environment and the processes that they will follow will be different. They'll be promoting differently. They'll be uh, uh, building the application a little differently. Um, they'll be working in a, in a browser environment for development and testing, um, um, if that's the way you choose to do it. Um, so the best way to, to deal with that is just to reassure them that they, they have the institutional knowledge and the application knowledge that is necessary. So just because you're moving to a different platform doesn't necessarily mean that uh, uh, your folks are irrelevant. The other biggest challenge, uh, I'm going to cheat. I'm going to give you two, 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 two items. Uh, the second biggest challenge is testing. Um, and I don't mean that testing is necessarily difficult. Uh, what I mean is that a lot of these applications have been running for decades and decades and they've enhanced. And because they have been running for so long and they have been uh, stable, um, applications, um, people tend to get a little, a little lazy around the test scripts and the documentation. So in these projects, of course, um, even though you're making a, a minimum amount of change, you still need to test that. Now, you don't need to test every line of logic. That's the great thing about listing from one platform and putting it on another. But you do still have to test. So um, there can be uh, some effort involved in creating test scripts um, that uh, that will validate that the new environment works. So that that is the other biggest challenge. Uh, Eddie, I don't know if you had anything else you wanted to add to that. No, I think you've covered it really well, actually, Greg. I think those are, those would be the two that I'd pick out straight away. Great. Wonderful. Uh, next question is from Ed Cruz. He would like to know what is the average time frame for doing a conversion? Yeah. So. Um, that really depends on a lot of factors, okay? It depends on how much code you have, uh, what kind of code you have, right? So the, the, uh, the, the larger uh, portfolio of languages you have can make it a little more complicated, right? If your language is primarily maybe limited to two or three languages like you know COBOL, JCL, and, and Assembler, then it's different than if you've got a little bit of everything. Now, it doesn't mean it can't be done. It just means that it can make it make it a little more complex and, and draw it out a little bit. So the size of the application, um, the amount of data, size of the database, um, all of these um, factor in into the final duration. But um, we moved... Um, uh, just as a gauge, we moved a couple of years ago uh, an application that was right around 3,000 MIPS, uh, took up about 3,000 MIPS, and we moved that in 18 months, end to end, from beginning to end. So that, that kind of gives you a, a little bit of a gauge, right? But again, you know, you could have the same size application that could be moved over in less time if, if it's all one language, right? So there's a number of factors there to play into that. Eddie, do you have any uh, any uh, thoughts on that? Um, well, I need to to you know I think the actual when you think about sort of a beginning to end, you know the actual process of, of moving the application itself is very fast, and I you know, totally agree. I think the the complexity of the application will drive how long it's going to take. Uh, but very often, the thing that actually takes the most time in, in any kind of um, you know, move from one platform to the next is the testing cycle. Testing cycle and actually preparation and, and you know, parallel running uh, before you switch over to the new environment. So that's typically the thing that takes time because you obviously want to make sure that, that the application is validated on the new platform. You're getting the same set of results that you would, would have done when you're running on the mainframe. Um, so, you know, again, just echoing what Craig said earlier about, you know, the, the the, the technology fit, that's often not the issue. It's then how do you actually go about testing and, and, and deploying into that new environment? That's the bit that, that takes up most of that time in, 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 a, in a migration project. All right, next question is from Matthew M. He was wondering how much overhead is involved uh, in the architecture emulation aspects of the microfocus environment? Um, I'm not sure if he what, what he means by overhead, whether he's referring to uh, 
uh, like processor overhead. Um, I, um, I do, there is not much. I'll let Eddie speak to that, and I'm assuming that that's what he means. So, Eddie, I'll let you address that. Um, yeah, I think um, I, I'm, I'm struggling as well in terms of actually understanding the, the you know, the, the, the detail behind the question. I think in terms of the, you know, there, there's several ways to sort of think about that. I think from an architecture perspective, you know, one of the things that, you know, we would look at, um, you know, when you're when you're planning the move is to understand, you know, not only actually, you know, what the application consists of but how the application is architected on the mainframe and then look at how that will then move across um, into you know how you'd architect that on a distributed system um, and again there are some decisions that you'd make there and obviously we try and keep things as, as as similar as possible but you know it is on a different infrastructure so you make some different design decisions uh, when you move from from the mainframe onto that distributed uh, cloud-based infrastructure um, so certainly you know You'd be making uh, making some architectural decisions at that point. Um, in terms of, um, you know, from maybe from a, a performance perspective, um, you know, all of the the, the, the data we have, and, and literally we have hundreds of customers that have moved workload onto the mainframe, or off the mainframe onto onto uh, enterprise server. You know, they typically, you know, will be seeing very significant improvements in performance. Um, when they move across uh, to that new environment, and they can can really start to, you know, particularly in batch, they can really start to, um, you know, see you know, performance improvements when when they move. They're not constrained, um, you know, in, in terms of the platform they're running on. And, and as we've seen in AWS, it's very easy to actually scale those environments. So if you have peak load, you can actually scale scale the the environment to actually cater for that peak load not really sure whether that answers the question i think there's probably a bit more detail behind that question that we, we may be missing there yeah and i'll just add to that you know um uh when this uh cutover that i referred to earlier in the in the presentation um there was some skepticism about you know whether it would be successful but whether it would work and uh, after we did the cutover onto the enterprise server environment uh, the batch cycle uh, was reduced drastically to everybody's surprise, and the client was very happy. So we do find that the performance does tend to work very well on an enterprise server. Um, yeah, I, I don't know what, what the overhead was. And also, uh, to Eddie's point, um, the nice thing about the cloud is you have virtually unlimited hardware configurations that you can try out in your in your design phase, right? So you can, can start putting pieces together as you get them and start trying out some performance uh, uh, runs, right? So you can uh, try different uh, main, uh, different machine configurations, and if you're not happy with the performance, make some tweaks to the architecture, to the size of the machine. Maybe you, instead of doing one large machine, you'd be better off doing a couple um, uh, smaller machines and load balancing between them. Uh, so there are a lot of things that you can try at a very low cost and to get it just right. All right, wonderful. We are running short on time. So if I have not addressed your question, we will make sure that we will uh, send you expert feedback on your question if it has not been already discussed. But I wanna make sure that we have time to go over additional information. For those of you on this call, we have an IBM mainframe to AWS, AWS reference architecture paper. This is a 17-page paper that is absolutely free that discusses all the things that were talked about uh, today and then some. So you could go to cloudgps.estadia.com or uh, you can wait for a thank you email will come out and it will have the exact direct link to that uh, reference architecture for you to download. So keep an eye out for that. Also wanted to let you know of some upcoming webinars that are taking place. Next month on the 22nd, we will be discussing the migrating IBM mainframe to Microsoft Azure. In the near future, we'll also be walking through Unisys mainframe 
and IBM Mainframe to Oracle Cloud. Those are separate events that will be announced shortly. However, if you are looking for more information on any of these topics uh, surrounding legacy modernization, uh, go to cloudgps.sdd.com and click on the Legacy Modernization tab. We have blogs and white papers that can address uh, anything on these topics. So definitely take a look. And I wanted to let you know, I promised you guys a special offer at the beginning of the presentation. So I wanted to let Eddie walk you through the special offer we have in store for you. Okay, thanks Desiree. So just very, very quickly, you know, this is a service that um, that, that, that we offer jointly with, um, with the Stadia. Uh, and really it's about working with you to actually understand your applications and your business and really get a view on the technical fit uh, and actually to provide some recommendations uh, on the next steps. Now, it's a complimentary service. Um, and as I say, Microfocus and the Stadia will run that together. And really, it's a, a proven first step. We've done this many, many times uh, to actually, you know, that first step to allow you to start moving to the cloud. Um, and if you do want to take advantage of that, then, then obviously there's an email address on, on the, the slide there, info at, uh, at stadia.com. Um, uh, and, you know, send us an email and uh, we'd be very happy to come on site and actually discuss the next steps with you. To zero, right back to you. Wonderful. This uh, webinar replay will be available on our website on Tuesday for you to download on demand. But if you are looking for more information specifically, please email info at astadia.com. So this concludes today's webinar. We appreciate having Craig, Eddie, and John all share their knowledge on moving IBM mainframe over to AWS. And most importantly, we appreciate you joining us today to learn more about this topic. We look forward to you joining us for our next webinar. Goodbye.